What I want to talk about is the illicit behavior that so many black folks get into and why this behavior is so prominent and it is so prevalent. Now, in the thumbnail, I use white drug dealers because this is a statistical fact. The majority of drug dealers are white. They're not black. And this is one of the craziest things because whenever you see an image of a drug dealer, unless you go to Google image and you start popping up all these white drug dealers, it is presumed that most drug dealers are black. And that's just not the case. But I was watching this podcast well, Edward Never Sleeps, The Wall Street Trapper. The Wall Street Trapper, he's a very interesting character. He has a lot of investment advice, of course, his own investment. And this guy was a drug dealer and spent 10 years in prison. And this podcast was so illuminating because the Wall Street Trapper, aka Leon Harris, admitted to things that I have been talking about for years. He admitted to it because when I used to live in the hood, I knew, I knew some of the drug dealers and I knew that they were not really economically doing better than I was. I mean, they were, I mean, it was like they were making a little bit more money, but they were not like head and shoulders where you would assume someone who was dealing drugs would be. And I'm going to put a link to the podcast because it is worth listening to because you're hearing it from someone who lived that life, who embraced that life. And essentially it was not one, but two white dudes that woke him up. See, this this is one of the things that we get into with the sensitive black folks, because, you know, nowhere can there be a white person or anything. And. As far back as slavery, there were white people who helped out black folks, who died for black folks. But no, 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 no. We, we can't talk about those white folks. Don't even bring them up. No, 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 no. But it was two white dudes that pointed him in the right direction. Because one of my biggest issues with the, the drug hustle culture is the high risk. And this is something that they talked about in the podcast. So essentially you go out, you do a few drugs, deals, you're looking at 10 to 15 years. Now, if you go out and these white dudes he met up in prison were in there for various charges. One, he knew he was in there for um, some kind of fraud. And essentially this is how he broke it down. He says, I'm in jail for two years and I got 2.8 million. I had to pay 800,000 back. So two years, 2 million. And he's like, when they get out, I'm going to do it again because at the most I'll get is five years and I'll do five years for 7 million. So right now you have some black dude in prison for three to five joints for 10 to 15 years, three to five joints. Yet you've got many people who are, you know, doing white collar crime who are getting millions and doing less time than you would do doing this street drug hustle culture. Now, this is a statistical fact. And this is one of the things that Leon Harris, AKA the wall street trapper admitted that he was in jail and dude told him he was doing, playing the wrong game. And when he got out, because this is one of the reasons that I feel that so many black people are drawn to this lifestyle is it's so cool. The wall street trapper, he even admitted that it was like, it's so cool, but he, he, he got into a very philosophical, deep conversation. He says, what you do is you rationalize that your life or your freedom is worth this hustle. And he said at the end of the day is not. And he actually said that after re-upping and buying more drugs, the average drug dealer doesn't make that much money. Now in the book Freakonomics, 
They actually talked about this in Freakonomics. They went out and interviewed a lot of drug dealers and they came up with the same information. He said that if you have, when, you know, he was working here in Atlanta building the Mercedes Benz Stadium, he was making 2,500 bucks a week. That was on par or more money than he was make hustling. He was one of those iron workers. He was up like 500 feet in the air, welding, building stuff. But I want you to understand this, 2,500 a week, working a regular job was more money than he made hustling in the streets. And this included having guns pulled on him and pulling guns on other people. And then while he was here in Atlanta, he began to realize that he needed to play a different game. And this is when he got into stocks and this is when he left all the street hustle stuff alone. Because even after having those seeds planted in his head while he was in jail, once he got out, he went back to what he knew how to do. He was relaying a story where he and a friend got pulled over and he took the charge because his friend, if his friend got the charge, his friend was going to go away for a long time. And he said the most he was going to get was probation. I'm a convicted felon. What, what, what's, what's probation? And, you know, from a rational point standpoint, I mean, seriously, you are already as messed up as you can be. What is a probation charge? It's nothing. And I mean, it was just so interesting listening to someone who lived that life and completed a transformation even after being told that that was going to be the wrong way to go. The guys in jail told him, he's like, look, you know, what you're doing is so high risk, so low reward. It's crazy. But here is the reason that so many black folks get into the street hustle culture. It looks cool. And they admitted this in the podcast. It's like, it's so cool that, you know, you get up, you, you roll your, you, you do whatever you do with the drugs. I don't know anything about drugs. I don't even know how you process or handle drugs. I have no clue, but you get up and do what you need to do. You, you hit the streets, you hit the trap and you know, it, it's just so cool that you're out here making money under your own power, which is noble to a degree, but the level of risk that you're taking is insane. Every time you get ready to pull a caper, sell some drugs, do whatever you're doing, you're putting your life and your freedom on the line. And he said, at some point, you just get used to it. It becomes your normal. And he actually talked about some of the stuff I'm talking about, the dysfunctional culture of the street hustle. He actually said, you know, you, you get in your head that this is cool, but it really is dysfunctional. He said, living in the hood, being part of the hood, you have to behave in a dysfunctional manner. Who, who's been talking about this the last few videos? I've been saying that hood culture, dominant black culture is dysfunctional. And right here, he, he go ahead and miss it because he's like, you're in the alternative universe where you're acting and behaving this way, but you feel that it is normal because you don't know anything else. And then once he uh, did the ironwork job, he's making 10 K a month. He started investing in the wall street and he got into it. And then he really got into it. He really got into it um, because he was making so much money legitimately. Like, let, let, let's just go ahead and keep it the buck. He was making $10,000 a month with taxes being taken out. So he was getting about $7,500 per month. That was more money than he was making toting a gun selling drugs, pulling guns on people. Cause he went from the transition. Uh, Cause once he got out, he, he got caught up and he beat some charges and he says, I ain't going to hustle no more like this. You know what his next thing he was going to do? I'm going to rob people. This is, this is after he has spent 10 years of his life in prison. 
He was like, this is the game. You know, if you're in the game, this is to be expected that if you are a drug deal, that someone's going to try to rob you. So he's like, he was talking about the OGs and the fact that, you know, you don't go out and rob a hardworking common man. You rob other drug dealers. And that's how he got down. That's how he made a living for two years. Then he came to Atlanta. Now, I want you to think about this. We go from dealing drugs to carrying a gun, pulling it on other drug dealers, robbing them of their drugs, and then selling their, their drugs that you get from the robbery ultra cheap. And this is how he made a living. I want you to think about that. Do you understand how many things could have went wrong? That one of these drug dealers could have had a gun and got to jump on him. He could be dead to this day. And, you know, he, he was talking about the dysfunctional culture. And now he's like, you know, what I do now, I don't have to worry about nobody being on me. If I'm having a phone conversation, I don't have to worry about the feds. Even if the feds are on my, got my phone tapped, I ain't really, I ain't doing nothing. He's like, it is such a different life to make money and be this way. And this is the transformation I'm talking about because you know, I want you guys to watch this because this is about an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes. I want you to watch it from the beginning to the end because it is worth watching because this is an individual who was living that life and he has transformed into Main Street America where he's making more money teaching people how to trade stocks and get in the stock market that he was hustling. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that. And you know, he gets into some stuff like uh, his mother is a lesbian. Crazy, crazy. He never knew who his father was. Then he got a call from his mother. His father was dying. He wanted to talk to him and he said no, which I can't understand. I'm like, okay, all these years, cause the dude is, he was 26 when he got out of jail. He's been out of jail. 13 years. So that would make him 39. And this was recent. And he's like, you weren't here all these years, all these unanswered questions. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to see you. I don't want to talk to you because you know, that's trying to alleviate your guilt on your deathbed. You know, you just gonna have to die with that. And that's how I went. And I can understand that because I was in a similar situation where, you know, my mother told me who my father was. And I was like, at this juncture, it don't really matter. I'm grown. I got all this stuff going on. I don't need a daddy. And I can 100% understand his position because, you know, if this had happened earlier where they, they can answer these questions, form a relationship, you know, he's like five, 10 years earlier. Okay. I would have been down, but this cat was about to check out. And I totally 100% understand uh, Leon's approach to that because I, I had, I made a similar decision because one of the things, and this is the dysfunction of black could culture. There are many of us who have no clue to who our father is. And this is commonly accepted. This is, well, your mom, she had her reasons. And this generates this path of dysfunction. That it is, you know, it's not normal to grow up not knowing who your father is, but in the black community, it is. There are so many folks who have no clue to who their daddy is because in many cases, the mom don't really know because the mom was a hoe. She has no clue to who the father was. And this gets to be really dicey and crazy because when you start pressing your mother about this information, they just shut down. Cause that's what my mom did. She just shut down. She didn't even want to talk about it because you know, it's like, well, it, it happened. And this is how the dysfunction goes from generation to generation to generation. Um, many of us don't have stories. You know, I had some relatives who promised to tell me what went down, but they, they passed on. And you know, this is such a good podcast and interview to see someone who was a hundred percent street hood and he made the transformation. He got out of that life. He got out of that life. 
and he reformed himself and he redeemed himself because you're playing the wrong game. Like as in freak econo Freakonomics, go ahead, there's a book you can get on Amazon, Freakonomics. It talks about how little money drug dealers make. This guy's uh, story and, you know, what I'm talking about, the attractiveness of hood culture. This is why we have love and hip hop. This is why we have, you know, the Housewives of Atlanta and what, most of those chicks aren't even married. That's so dysfunctional. But this is the dysfunction of black hood ghetto culture that is so predominant. I saw a discussion where people were talking about the book from Eugene Robinson, the disintegration of black America and how there were four black Americas. And I agree. I just disagree about the population size of this dysfunctional hood culture. I think it's the largest segment of black culture. And then you have the black folks who adapt Main Street methods and moving and making things happen and owning the American dream. I think that's just a much smaller segment. I don't think that's the largest segment. And, you know, the left behind people, and I've talked about them before. Right now, someone put up a great comment. I'm going to put it up in the community section about what's going on. All of these businesses are going out of business and all these people who are unemployed, and this is killing this V-shaped recovery. Right now we have states that have opened up, they're beginning to reclose, uh, Atlanta has reclosed. We, we, we're gonna have some mess going on until about 2023. This, this is gonna be sad. And there are many, many people who want to adapt this hustle street culture, and I'm here to say, don't do it. You would be better off starting a side business. You would make more money legitimately than doing this hustle stuff because, you know, he, he spoke candidly. He said, you know, once you re up and everything, you know, you don't really make that much money. And this, this, this evidence of when he got this job here in Atlanta and he was making 2,500 a week, he saw that as more money than hustling. Because, see, this is one of the things that happen. Let, let's say you're a drug dealer. And let's say you move $100,000 a month of product. Hey, man, I'm flipping hundred k a month. Sounds good. But when you look at your cost, your cost of the product, your cost of the you know, people that you employ, your cost are like $95,000. So you only netted $5,000, even though you flipped 100K. And this is why when the Leon began a robbing, he started robbing all the drug dealers. This is why he was able to make so much money because he was getting his product for free. So every, you know, whether he sold it for what it was worth or close to what it was worth, he still made profit. He was making more money robbing these drug dealers than the drug dealers themselves were by turning the profit. Now, this is the preponderance of the entry-level drug dealer. I'm not talking about the middlemen or the guys at the top, the guys who are moving like a million pounds of dope a month. We're not talking about them. These guys are making millions of dollars a day. They're making so much money that they have a problem on how to launder their cash. Totally different situation. But the majority of those top tier drug dealers are white and Hispanic. They're not black. I want you to think about that. So black folks go in and take all of the risk, their freedom or their life for chump change. Chump change. It's the craziest thing ever. So I'm going to put a link to the podcast. Be sure to check that out. And also look at what you're doing if you're part of America. It's like, you know, last video I talked about, you know, if you're born in America, you're an American. And it is time that you started to celebrate your American privileges and start to adapt and operate on those principles. So one of the first things you can do is go below, get 30 days to 2,500, 
Get the hustler's mindset, pimp your mind for success. Go ahead and get that. And then if you are in the help, because like I'm telling you, what he learned, because you're playing the wrong game if you just have a job. What he learned was he had to, you know, have a business, have investments, have land. That's the game you want to play. I got a video on Savage Finance that is coming up about how to develop generational wealth. I explained the whole situation to you. That's going to come up in the morning. So be, be looking for that. But one of the things that you've got to understand that you got to play a different game to get different results. And so many people are scared or they're just seduced because street life, hustle life is so seductive. It just pulls you in. It pulls you in. And I'm here to tell you it ain't worth it because let's say you're a drug dealer and you make 150 K a year, but you go after three years, you made 450,000, but you go to jail for 15 years. Divide the 19 years because you, 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 you made 450 for four years. Let's see, three years. Yeah, three years. Then you got the 15 and divide 18 into 450. Hold on. I, I want to I wanna get this. I want to get this right. Let's see what that's going to be. 450,000 divided by 18 is 25,000 a year. Chump change, 25,000 a year. And this consistently happens because these guys will go out, they'll be making good money and then they'll get arrested and go away for 10, 15, 20 years. And that all counts. So as this uh, guy told the Wall Street Trapper, he's like, you're playing the wrong game. You know, I went ahead and got 2.8 million. I got to give up 800,000 in restitution and I get to keep 2 million and all I'm doing is two years. You were out there, you just got caught with a little bag of drugs and you're in here for 10 years. It's like the guy said that he could go do his time, get out, do it again, go back to prison and still be out before the Wall Street Trapper, you know, he was just like that. That just kind of messed with me because it's like essentially you can go out, get more money, do less time, get out, do it again and still get out before I do. Just crazy. So go ahead, check out the this podcast is worth watching and I will see you guys in this next video.